Hello, my name is Hilary Marlowe and welcome to this Lausanne seminar on Creation Care and Christian Mission, the Gospel in Action. I'm really hoping the technology works and you can hear and see everything. I will make the slides available to the organisers um, in case they have a, a way of distributing them to you. Concerns about climate change and other environmental issues are at the front, forefront of global news in the wake of the COP26 summit in Glasgow, which is taking place as I record this talk. But what does this have to do with Christian faith and why does it matter for the church's mission and outreach? In the first part of this seminar, I will explore a biblical basis for creation care. And then my friend Marcial Felgueras, Executive Director of Arrocha Portugal, will draw on his own experience to relate this practically to the church's mission. So what has this to do with Christian faith? I'd like to suggest two aspects to this question. The first is what I call the outward facing aspect, which is to do with mission and apologetics, our engagement with the world. And the second is more inward facing. It's about what it means to be a Christian disciple in the 21st century. So why does creation care matter for mission and apologetics? Well, it's about being relevant in an age where Christianity is dismissed as outdated and irrelevant, especially amongst young people. It's about countering scepticism and hostility towards religion, especially from voices that say that, that the Christian tradition was in some way responsible for the environmental mess that we're now in. It's also about the church being a prophetic voice in its own society and speaking up on behalf of those that have no voice. But interestingly also there is a challenge towards to us as the church from secular scientists. Have a look at this quote. This is from Gus Beth who is um, a leading um, environmental um, scientist in Harvard University, he said this, I used to think that the top global environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science we could address these problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed and apathy, and to deal with these we need a spiritual and cultural transformation, and we scientists don't know how to do that. But of course, spiritual and cultural transformations are at the heart of the Christian gospel. So I'd like to suggest that we have something unique to offer to bring about change in our world. The second and inward facing aspect of why it matters is to do with discipleship and here we might like to think about what that means for our worship, what it means to worship God, what it means to obey God and how that faith, that worship, that obedience is worked out in practical action. There are many biblical and theological reasons to give environmental care the highest priority. So I'd like to think a little bit more about these. And I've split this into four key areas, which together, I suggest, make up the story of God and his world. Let's think first of all then about creation and what it means to say God as creator of heaven and earth. The Psalms remind us, as do other parts of the scripture, that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He made heaven and earth. And we repeat that, those of us in our, our liturgical tradition, every time we say a creed in a Sunday service, we believe in God, maker of heaven and earth. We affirm God as our creator. Psalm 104, which is a, a wonderful psalm, I heartily recommend it to you, all about creation, talks about God creating in wisdom. And in some senses, the created world reflects the wisdom of God. And God also creates with intent and creates something that is fit for the purpose he intended it for. It was very good, is the verdict on creation at the end of Genesis chapter 1. What then is the purpose of creation? 
Why did God create? Uh, several reasons, I suggest. The first is we're told in the Psalms that creation reflects God's glory. There is something in the created order that whether it's the, the cosmic scale of the stars or in the minute detail of, of a, a small flower or even a microscopic organism that reflects something of the creativity and wonder and mystery of God. But also in the Psalms, we're told that the whole of creation is told to praise God. The whole of creation offers praise to God. That isn't something that just us human beings do. But trees in Psalm 148, it's trees, it's rocks, it's mountains, as well as people are instructed to praise God. That's the capacity to praise, although we do it in a very different way, is not something that separates us from other parts of creation. It's actually something that unites us with it. In the prophets, we read about another aspect of creation's purpose in Hosea. Uh, in a passage we'll look at a bit later on, we see how the, the creation laments the sinfulness of its human inhabitants. And in the prophet Amos, the earth cries out against the injustice, again, of human beings within society. So how then do we fit into this picture? What about us as human beings? Well, we're very clearly part of creation. We are not gods. We are not somehow separate from the rest of creation. Psalm 104 makes this very clear. We are, we, we share our creatureliness with other animals. We're made from the dust as are other, other creatures. We share the breath of life with other animals. That shared creatureliness reminds us not to think more highly than we should of ourselves. But of course we also have unique responsibilities as the image of God. And in the ancient world the, the image of God or the image of a God or a king was someone or something that was representing that deity or that ruler in a particular place. In some ways we represent God on earth but not in a a way to lord it over other species, but to fulfill God's creation mandate to be those that tend his garden, those that care for and look after what he has made. I just like us to, to pause for thought now, and this might be something you want to take away and think about. A couple of questions. What does the way we treat the earth say about our own relationship with God? And what are the consequences when parts of God's creation are destroyed by human activity or neglect? Let's move on now to think about the second aspect, which is covenant. Covenant is the hallmark of God's relationship within, with his world. And of course, there are several covenants in the Old Testament. But the first covenant in the Bible is that with Noah after the flood, and it includes the whole creation. It is not just a covenant with Noah and his family. After the flood, God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. I will remember the everlasting covenant that is between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on earth. Elsewhere in scripture, we find examples of how this covenant was broken by its human inhabitants. Isaiah 24, the earth lies polluted under its inhabitants. They've transgressed laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. And Jeremiah 9, why is the land ruined and laid waste like a wilderness? The Lord says, because they've forsaken my law that I set before them and have not obeyed my voice or walked in accordance with it. I've already referred to Hosea chapter 4 and this is another example of that broken breakdown of relationship between God and people and then the lamenting or mourning of the land. You might like to think a little more detail about these verses. What strikes you about them? In what ways are they relevant today? 
The third key area of our exploration of a biblical basis for creation care is summed up in the one word Christ. Let's think a little bit about the person and work of Christ. First of all, Christ himself is the creator and sustainer of everything that exists. In him all things in heaven and on earth were created, says Colossians. All things have been created through him and for him. But not only is Christ the creator of all things, he becomes part of his creation. The mystery of the incarnation is that creator becomes a creature. The word became flesh, John's Gospel tells us. What does it mean for the creator of all things to become part of that world with all its limitations? John's Gospel goes on to remind us that the saving act of Jesus Christ is for the whole world. God so loved the world, says John 3. God sent his world in, in, did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world may be saved through him. The whole world, the cosmos in the Greek. And Colossians 1 picks that idea up when it talks about all creation being reconciled to God, not just human beings, all creation, because Christ made peace through the blood of his cross. Each of these four things could be the focus of a whole study and reflection, but we have to move on. And just quickly, I won't talk about all these in detail, but notice number of different ways in which the earth responds to the coming of Christ into his creation in his birth, during his ministry and his temptation, and again at his crucifixion. Let's move on now to the, the fourth aspect of creation care from a biblical point of view, and I've titled this Completion. Some theological minded people might want to use the term consummation, but I think completion sums up what the way that I, I think about it. And this has to do with our ultimate hope, our ultimate hope of a new heaven and a new earth. It's not that the earth will disappear, it's about renewal of what is, it's the renewal of all things, it's about the removal of the things that cause distress, sin, grief and sickness. It's not about the complete eradication of the, the earth. Interestingly in Revelation we're told that it will be a time of judgment of course, we're told that God's judgment will destroy those who destroy the earth which is a rather telling throwaway comment in the light of our present environmental predicament. So this is what we look forward to. It's something that is not of our doing. We cannot make it happen. It's something that is in God's hands. The timing of it is in God's hands. But I'd like to suggest that that isn't the only hope that we live with in the present. Because the present reality is that the kingdom of God has already come. Luke says the kingdom of God is among you. It came in the person of Christ. It was enacted in his death and resurrection and is very much the hope in which we live now. It's the hope that God is already at work in the risen person of Christ in our midst. And that's what motivates us to do all that we do, isn't, doesn't it? To, to, to work for God in this world. The challenge is that we're, we're struggling, we're wrestling with the here but not yet aspect of the kingdom. And Romans 8 sums it up. The creation, the whole creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. The whole creation has been groaning in labour pains as it waits for redemption. This seems to me to suggest that there is something that the creation is waiting for us to fulfil of our creation mandate. It's about being those that bring the kingdom of God closer by the way that we act, about the way that we work 
in God's world as those that he's called to be his workers. It's about being called to action, as James reminds us. We have to be those that do and not merely those that listen and speak, I should add, probably. It's, this is something that, in a way, we, we invite every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, we pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done. How does that happen? What does it mean to pray those words? Well, I think it's a very, oops, sorry, lost the slide. I think it's a very practical thing. We're praying something that we actually have to take part in doing. For example, the second commandment, Jesus says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. What does it mean to love our neighbor as ourselves? As ourself, we'll think a little bit more in a moment. In Mark's Gospel, the Great Commission is phrased rather differently from Matthew. It talks about going into all the world and proclaiming the good news to the whole creation. The good news of Jesus, his reconciliating, reconciling work, his death on the cross, is good news for the whole creation, not just for us human beings. And we're the ones to take it out there. We are the ones to demonstrate it, to bear witness to it, and to work with God in bringing that good news into the world. In the words of Pope Francis in Laudato Si, if you've not read that, I really recommend it to you. It's about hearing the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor for justice, for God's voice to be brought to it. As I draw for a, to a close, here's another pause for thought. In the global village in which we live, where our actions, particularly those of us in the West, have untold capacity to damage the livelihoods of people on the other side of the world, whether through exploitative practices, um, power dynamics, environmental, degradation in our global village who is my neighbor and how should I be loving that neighbor what is good news for all creation think about how we might enable all creation to praise God to fulfill its God-given purpose and then finally how can we be the body of Christ his hands and feet in our broken world Thank you very much for listening and now my friend Martial will share some of his story based on his own experience working for Arosha in Portugal. God bless you. Good afternoon. After the talk of Dr. Hilary Marlowe, I come to you where she has explained you the biblical principle for creation care. I bring to you a practical example of an organization, uh, Rocha, that's the name, uh, which is a Christian organization working in nature conservation. For us, uh, one of the basic pillars of our work is that the fact that we are a Christian organization. This gives us reason, this gives us a motivation, and give, this gives us hope for our work. Reason because we have a God who's the creator of all things, is also the sustainer of all things, but is also, above all, the redeemer of all things. Not only humans, but also the created order. So this gives us a motivation, a reason, and a hope to continue, because we believe in new heavens and new earth that God himself will um, bring back to us. Now, in practice, what does this organization uh, does actually well if it is a conservation organization we have three main things that we are involved with environmental education scientific research and environmental advocacy education is not only about uh, teaching the younger generations but actually working across 
the the whole uh, spectrum of people working with the children, with the parents, sometimes even with the elderly, because we're always in a good age to learn things and to change our behavior. We, the Christians, more than anyone else, should believe in change because we are people who have changed. We have converted our ways. We were in one direction, we changed to another direction. So we, we can do, everyone can do. Science is very, uh, a very useful tool and we use the best um, scientific methodologies that we can come up with. Uh, or we can do in partnership with universities um, to get to know the locations uh, where we are, what are the species that inhabit those, those areas, what are the habitats, the ecosystems, how do they relate with each other, what are the threats, and what can be done to prevent those threats and to uh, improve the well-being of, uh, of the, those living creatures. And last but not least, uh, advocacy. An advocate is one who speaks for those who cannot have a voice. That kind of could apply to all living creatures, the plants, the birds, and, and so on. But it can also apply for those who are disadvantaged, those who are poor, who, are, um, who would not know how to uh, do this sort of uh, work. This brings us the community aspect of our work. It's both uh, uh, an internal community, let's put it that way, the, the team and the visitors who are students, their professors and, and others, but also the wider community, the community where we are based. This means getting to know them, being uh, in close contact, getting to know what are their dreams, what are their, their hopes, what are their needs. This also means the element of time, that we need to give ourselves time and invest time to be with people. We are in this conference on Zoom. And uh, if everyone is like me, it's not, not only difficult to be in such a conference in Zoom, but even more difficult to record this thing without having any of you behind there to interact with me. We are community people. We come from a community God, a triune God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We were made in the image and likeness of God, and therefore we are people of a community. And for us, it's very important to look after this community where we are placed by God. This brings another aspect, and probably the last one that I will talk with you about, the aspect of cooperation. Not everyone that we work with are Christian. That's good, in my view, because we do scientific work. We end up doing several areas in, in terms of community work, but it means that we also rub shoulders with those who do not think like we do about Christ and gives us the opportunity to share the gospel in words and most of the times in deeds. And that's a very good thing that we can do with our um, colleagues and friends. I would like to end my time because uh, I know uh, Dr. Hillary took 23 minutes, so we want to respect the, the, the half an hour, and I have about a minute now. Finish again with the element of hope. A hope that should motivate us all to engage in creation care. We've just had the COP26. Quite a lot of those people are doing their demonstrations and doing things out of despair because they, they say we have no planet B. Actually, I would even go further. We have no planet A. The planet in which we are living does not belong to us. It belongs to God. And as, as we should care for everything which belongs to someone else, to give it back to that person in the same state, if not even better than we found it, then we should do the same about God's planet. It's not our planet, it is God's planet. Let us all do our little things in hope and knowing that we have a loving God that works with us, sustains us, redeems us, 
and who is who is preparing who is on a way of doing a new heavens and new earth for us all to enjoy down here with us god bless you and uh, have a wonderful time